Today we're going to discuss one of the famous stories in the Torah, the story of the spies. How Moses sent 12 spies to scout out, to check out the land of Israel. The Jews were about were supposed to, according to plan, they were supposed to be there within a few days. And before they went in, he sent spies. They came back with a, with a negative report. And the, everyone sort of was convinced by this report and everything really changed years then. If up until that point, the nation was, the, that generation was such a special generation, the generation that was taken out of Egypt, Shem took them out, and then the seas split before them, and then they experienced the giving of the Torah. They built the Mishkan the Tabernacle, which was Hashem's home in this world. And really, they're, they're the nation. And all of a sudden, everything turned around. As soon as they were convinced by the narrative of the spies, and they started to complain, that sort of brought an end to them. First, Hashem wanted to destroy them. Moshe prayed to Hashem on their behalf. He said, it's not such a good idea. One of the arguments that he, that he told Hashem on, on behalf of the, of the nation of that, of, the, that, of that generation was that if, we're going, if you're going to destroy them, the nation that you took them out said, okay, you're able to take them out of Egypt. Egypt had one nation. Israel has many, many kings, they're split into many kingdoms, 36, and or something around that number. And you're not able to fight against those kings. So he just killed them out in the in the in middle of the desert. They won't know that they sinned against you. So Hashem said, You're right. And he said, I'm going to split the no one from this generation is going to enter the land of Israel, but I'm going to split. The knock of the all pass would be killed at once. So every year, approximately 15,000 people passed away. So it really was a turning point for that generation. While they were taken out of Egypt and saw the experience, the giving of the Torah, but they never really entered Israel. And after the stories, when things really started to go in a different direction, they started to wander around in the desert. They are buried in the desert. No one knows where they were buried. This change, this drastic change, wasn't just for the generation as a whole, but it was also for Moshe in particular. Because of this episode and the Jews uh, staying wandering in the desert, it eventually turned out in a somewhat an indirect way that, in a somewhat indirect way that Hashem said that Moshe wasn't able to go into Israel. And really, it affects us until this very day. The day that the spies came back, we all know, was the day of the ninth of Av, Tisha B'Av, which on the Jewish calendar is a very dark day. It's a day of mourning from all, for all generations. That's the day that the two temples were destroyed. And really, Hashem said that when the Jews heard the, the account of the spies, and they were convinced and they started to cry. Hashem said, now you're crying for something that's no good reason. I promise that years down the line, you're going to be promised, you're going to be crying on this day, on this night, and it'll be for something that actually went wrong, something that actually wasn't good. So that day sort of from that point was marked on the calendar as a day which is set aside for not the best occurrences. What started all of this? What started, what triggered this whole change? This whole change, what triggered it, what started it was the Jews, the, spy, the spies going to Israel and coming back with this bad account. And the question is, why wasn't it stopped earlier? Why wasn't it able, why wasn't Moshe able to detect what, that something is going wrong? Maybe to detect that maybe something could go wrong. 
And as we shall soon see that there, there seems to be some pretty clear hints that something is not smooth there. And Moshe, the leader of the generation, the ideal leader of, of the Jewish nation, ideal leader in general, why wasn't he able to detect and stop, you know, stop this episode before it, before it uh, went out of hand and before this evil change of, chain of events took place. So for this, let's step back and really look at the beginning of the story. How did it all start? In this week's Torah portion, it, it starts with the words of Shlach. Hashem tells Moshe, Shlach, send out spies, send out miraglu, send out people that would tour and scout out the land. Now, the Torah really starts from step two of the story. The Torah skit doesn't say what really started this whole, how did it come out? Hashem said, send in the middle of a middle of the day, a clear day. Hashem just said, send out spies. How did it start? So while on this week's Torah portion, it's, it's really closed off and we don't really have a, we don't know how it started. Later in the beginning of the fifth book of the Torah, which the fifth book of the Torah is really all the words of Moshe. It's Moshe speaking all the way through. So there, Moshe is to end the, the last few days of Moshe's life, where he's, where he's rebuking the Jewish nation and reminding them of the important mitzvahs that they should remember before they enter the land of Israel. And he tells them some of the uh, big mistakes that they made throughout the 40 years in the desert, reminding them to that they shouldn't repeat those mistakes. And there he gives more context for this, for the beginning of the story of how the whole story of the spy started. So let's see how the Torah, how Moshe tells it to the Jewish nation, the beginning of the story in the beginning of the Vara. So he tells it, to, he says like this, and I said to you, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it. As the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you, you shall neither fear nor be dismayed. Right? So Moshe said, we're right now outside of Israel, a few days outside of Israel. This is the land that Hashem promised as an eternal um, uh, inheritance for the nation of Israel. So go ahead and inherit the land. Take over the land. And all of you approached me and said, let us send men ahead of us so that they will search out the land for us and bring us back word by which route we should go up and to which cities we shall come. So here the Torah, Moshe tell, tells them what happened. I said, it's time to go. Let's enter the land of Israel. And you said, not so fast. All of you approached me, meaning this was a communal decision, a general decision that all of you made and decided that we can't just go into the land of Israel. Let us send out men that should search the land and bring us back word how we should conquer it, which route we should take, and where we should start. And here Moshe said, and the matter pleased me. I was happy with it. Moshe didn't say red flags start to go off and, and bells started to ring in my, my mind. What, what's happening here? Is this the right thing? Is this, is this the proper thing? I liked it. I liked the idea. Rashi over there comments on the last words that says, and the matter pleased me. And he really zooms into this phrase, the matter pleased me. It doesn't say it was a good matter. It says that it pleased me. So he explains it pleased me, but it did not please the God. It did not please God. But if it pleased Moses, why does he mention it in his rebuke? If Moses didn't find anything wrong with it, anything wrong with the request that we want to send out scouts that would scout out the land. So why does he mention it in his rebuke? So Rashi actually brings a very interesting parable which I think is very relatable. He says, this may be compared to a man that says to his friend, sell me this donkey of yours. Right? I want to buy your car. 
We advised them, yes, I'm ready for sale. So will you give it to me to test it? Could I make, could I take it around a test run? Could I, could I go around the block with it? He replies, yes. May I test it on mountains and hills? Yeah, could I test it off-road? Could I test it in the countryside? And he replies, yes. When he sees that his friend does not withhold anything from him, the purchaser thinks to himself, this man is certain I shall not, that I shall not find any defect in, his, in, his, in the donkey. So an immediate says to him, take your money. I need not test it now. Right? He, see, he sees how short the seller is by that his, that his car, let's say in our case, his car is going to last and uh, is, going to, is, is going to pass any test. So he says, so the buyer right away puts down the money and takes the car and drives off with it. So I took assented to your words, thinking that you would perhaps reconsider when you saw that I did not withhold it from you. But you did not reconsider. You insisted in sending spies, and that's what we did. So what we see from here is that this, this, the whole initiative, who, who, whose initiative was sending the spies? It was from the nation. The nation wanted to send these spies, and Moshe uh, agreed to them. And he said, I was happy with it. I had no problem. I said, I thought on the contrary, let them go out, let them scout out the land. And, for, and on the other hand, let them let you should see how good the land is and how I'm not withholding anything, no secrets, no, 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 uh, no fine letters. You can see the land for yourself. What's interesting actually is that the while we usually call the story of the that 12 spies were sent in Hebrew, 12 miraglim, the Torah doesn't really use the term miraglim, spies. The Torah says you sent 10 people to, to look at the land, to scout out the land, to see the land. It doesn't say this, this term of spies. And some of the commentaries explain that there's really two, almost two types of messengers that could come from a country looking at another country. There could be spies, and then there could be people scouting out. And the difference is, is clear. These 12, if, if you want to send spies to a, another country, you probably won't send 12 people as a group, right? 12 people show up by the border. Yeah, we're here from, I don't know, from a few hundred miles away, we want to just see your country. What are you doing here? Business trip? No business. No, we just we just want to we just want to come, right? That's pretty. And they know that you're approaching the country. You want to conquer the country, right? So, not a very good idea. Especially that these twelve people were, were famous people. They're heads of tribes. They were famous people. People that were that had status, right? They weren't just. A secret someone on a, a secret person on a secret mission that no one really knew the identity. The Torah lists who they were, and they're known for the they're known with throughout the nation who they were. And again, when you send spies, usually it's it's someone which it's identity is not public, right? The head of uh, the general doesn't go doesn't go spying because everyone knows who the generals are. You send the uh, simple uh, regular people, people that are more disguised to spy. So here it wasn't really about spying the land. But rather here it was to scout out the land, to see the land, to see the qualities of the land, to see the, the types of fruit that are there. Moshe said, bring back samples of fruit, to see the type of cities that are there, but not really as spies. And like, and this is really in sync with the idea that we just read, how Moshe, the, how Moshe was really like, Telling them that, yeah, you could take it for a test run. You could take it for a test drive. On the other hand, there is a case in the Torah where we do see that spies were sent out, which is Yehoshua. Joshua, when he, when he actually, Moses, uh, Moses um, a student, that when he, he is the one that actually took the Jewish nation into, 
Israel. And he told them that, and before he went into the first, conquered the first city that he saw, he he sent two spies. But there, the Torah, the, the, the Torah, actually the prophets, the first prophet, the beginning of the book of book of prophets, doesn't tell us who they were. And it's unknown who they were. And it wasn't 12 people, it's two people. And they didn't go in broad daylight marching across the land, collecting samples of fruit and coming back with wagons and big loads of fruit. They came simple, they, 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 they came quietly, they, they escaped quietly, really without a commotion. That was spies. There, there was, he was actually sending spies on a military mission. And they're actually, the Torah calls them spies in Hebrew Miraglim, right? So we have this idea that the 10 people that were sent weren't really so much on a military mission, but they're more there to see the land. Wait, they're there to see the land, to check out the land? Why do they have to check out the land? Oh, because the Jews wanted to see. Is it a good land or not? Wait, that means they were questioning the promise that Hashem gave their forefathers and them that they're going, he's going to bring them to a good land, a land of milk and honey. If that's the case, why didn't Moshe stop them? Yes, maybe in the beginning, but as soon as he sees what's happening, that they're questioning if it's a good land, that's why they're sending out these scouts. He should have realized something is terribly wrong. And he should have stopped this whole plot in his tracks before, before anything got out of, out of control. And actually, some of the commentaries hold this against Moshe. Moshe says, Moshe, didn't do, Moshe did something wrong here. He should have realized there's something not okay. To make, thing, to make things even more complicated, if we take a look at the beginning of this week's Torah portion, the Torah uses an interesting wording. This is the opening uh, verse of this week's Torah portion, number three. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, send out for yourself men who are scouted around the command, right? So it says, which I, am, which I am giving to the children of Israel. Send out for yourself. What does that mean? Send out for yourself. That's a somewhat of a cryptic statement. Send out. What's for yourself? So Rashi picks up on this phrase. And he explains, send out for yourself according to your own understanding. I am not commanding you. But if you, if you wish, you may send. Send out for yourself means send out based on your own decision. You, you get to decide. Wait, Hashem is telling Moshe, you get to decide. To decide. That should for sure trigger something in Moshe's head. And wait, something's going ter something's terribly wrong here. Up until now, Moshe always received commandments from Hashem. What to do? Even at times, when the Jewish nation came with a request, Hashem never told Moshe, you decide. Hashem told Moshe, Yes, listen, don't listen. For example, we had in last week's Torah portion, we spoke about it last week in last class, that there was Jews that weren't able to bring this, the Passover sacrifice in its right time. And Hashem said, and they, they came to Moshe, why should we miss out? Moshe, what did Moshe say? Wait, let me ask Hashem what we should do. And Hashem said, you know what? Listen to them. And uh, we'll give them a second Passover. So Hashem didn't say, oh, Moshe, you figure out what to do with them. No, the Jews came with a request. And Hashem said a straight and concrete answer. We find other times. We find previously in the Torah that, um, also we spoke about two weeks ago, that the, that the heads of the tribes wanted to bring offerings to the to the tabernacle to inaugurate it. So there's no commandment for it. They brought it to Moshe. 
And Moshe didn't take it right away. He waited for Hashem to say, take it from them. So even when the Jews came with their own, something on their own behalf, on their own initiative, they wanted to do something, or they wanted a certain commandment to be given, Moshe never just made a decision. Moshe always waited to hear what Hashem said. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden here, Hashem, the Jews came with this request, a somewhat odd request. Which is, which is a troubling request that they didn't have full trust that the land is a good land. And not only Moshe didn't send them away, and instead he said, okay, I'll ask Hashem what to do. Hashem tells him, you know what? You decide. So Moshe said, wait, something's going to- terribly wrong. If Hashem is saying, I should decide, it's probably not a good idea. This is the first time I'm hearing these words, I should decide. Send it based on your own understanding. But no, Moshe said, I should decide. I decide yes, and we're going to send. Isn't this, isn't something off? Isn't something missing? Why didn't he tick up these red flags? All right, so we passed the... 20 minutes or so, we developed this question that in the story of the spies, Hashem sent, Hashem, it wasn't a commandment from Hashem to send out, send out these scouts, to send out these people to check out the land, but rather it came from the people, came from the nation. And seemingly their whole, the basis of the request was, was problematic, that they wanted to know, they, they, that they want, they came with initial that they want to send out, send out these scouts, these people to scout out the land. It seems like they were missing a little trust in Hashem. Maybe they didn't trust that the land is as it was promised. And maybe they didn't trust that it would be conquered as easily as, as it was promised to them. So they wanted to check out where's the best place to, to start with. And we asked, why did Moshe stop them? Why did Moshe said, not a good idea? And also, to make things worse, Hashem didn't tell Moshe to do it or not to do it. Hashem said, send out based on your own understanding. He gave it. Motion, he gave the option to motion, which again, if he's giving the option to motion, that sounds like something is pretty off because he never did that before. So, probably there's something wrong, and Moshe should have stopped it, but he didn't. So, that's why we have to understand why didn't Moshe just stop it right away? How did he miss such clear indicators? Anyone have any thoughts? Yeah. I think uh, Moses was at the end of his life and I think he knew it. And he maybe was off himself, not, not really, uh, he had gone through so much with, with these people that he, maybe he was tired. And the thing is, he, Maybe he understood that they have to make their own mistakes, that the people are not really ready to take, to go into the land. And they should have never sent, I mean, if they sent those people in, the other people who are living on the land are gonna know somebody's coming to, to conquer us, which is really not a good idea for, for the, you to, you know, to send, you know, strangers into a land that's, the whole thing is a debacle. I mean, right. so what? What are, you're saying that Moshe let them make the mistake? He didn't want to put up a fight with them. Maybe I, I don't. You know, it's just the whole. Well, thing actually, because he because he didn't put up a fight, he ended up with another forty years of bleeding them around in the desert. Israel will be better. At least they'll be all over like this. Imagine you're stuck in. For 40 years with the same people and the same uh, few, uh, you know, 
The same cam? All right. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, I think it's a test by Hashem to Moses to see what kind of leader he would be when they got into the land of Eretz Israel. All right. So you're anyway. saying that Moshe really should have stopped them, but Hashem was testing him to see if he will stop them or not. I think Hashem was testing Moshe. Moshe. Mm -hmm. Right. So Moshe really should have not let them go. Right. He wants to see if Moses right. is complete and what kind of leader he would be in, in the land. Right. Okay, that's uh, another option. Um, yeah. Yeah, I believe that it could you be... You keep saying, yeah, but you're not naming the people. I don't understand it because I don't see all the people. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's... It's Anna, Ben. Um, okay. I, I believe that it could be two reasons. One reason that he was really, really tired of complaints before, and he kind of gave in a little to the pressure of people who supposed to, you know, to, to do things. He felt that as a, a you know, matter of free choice, they should have an opportunity to express it and maybe to make their own mistakes. This is number one. Second, because he was responsible, he felt probably responsibility for these people. He wanted to make sure that the land that they are going to um, occupy, that they, they're going to, to live in, uh, would be something that is appropriate too. Maybe that was the reason. It's just both explanations, I think, is because he felt so much in charge for good and bad things that it's possible that he wanted to have an opportunity for people to see it themselves. I understand perfectly well that in this relationship, lack of trust is probably breaking the deal. Because if you, you want to test what I commanded you to do, will it be tests in the future too every time when I will tell you to do something on, on the side of, of Hashem? I understand perfectly well why it was a mistake. But Moses was human and he was a leader who went through so many different bad times and difficult times. That's why... He probably just had it as a weak part of, of his decisions. That's why it's kind of, it was a mistake where um, in some cases he was forced to do it. I don't think that he had any doubts. I think he simply gave in to the Good will nice. of people. Okay, right. that's, I think that's my Gave in, you said, I think you said two points that he, for free choice, like let them make their own decision and gave in that there shouldn't be a lack of trust. Yeah, yeah, I think that it was definitely a mistake that he did this decision, but at that point, maybe he did not see it that way. He did not see it as a moral issue. He maybe wanted to have it as a protection for people that he was responsible for. Okay, interesting. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, I, I think just uh, just last month we were told that there was three. They have three days. They are, then people were told they have three days and they'll be in Israel. Right. So maybe they slept on it and and got scared and and said, "Well, we, we better check it out before we get in there." <laughs> so, but but Moses and this, the reason Moses sent the, the spies is he understood that if people are not sure about going in and fighting for it, they're not gonna win. You have right. to be motivated to fight if you're going right. to win. So he was forced to send the spies. Even though God didn't, didn't tell him to do so, he offered him out, but he knew that he cannot fight with those people. They're not right. gonna fight. Right, so he's saying he need to he he needed to give in because if they wanted to take over the land, they have to be happy with it. And no, they have to it. be motivated to fight, right. and they are not. Right. Yeah, and we discussed this yesterday a little. 
that people usually compare situations. And in their case, at this point, they practically lived uh, in heaven. It was amazing life. They lived in, in, you know, under protection of God. They had enough food. They have everything that they possibly could imagine. They had a close connection with spiritual life. That's why they had a lot to lose if something would go wrong. That's why it was kind of a second thought. Yeah, right. you're talking about buying a car. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But they already had a Cadillac. <laughs> that's why it was a Cadillac or Porsche. That's why right. <laughs> maybe they decided it's safer to stay with a Cadillac. <laughs> it's, it's a... I think it's a fear of success. I agree completely. Yesterday we discussed that, that sometimes when it's a change ahead of you, you start thinking, oh, am I ready to lose what I have instead of having something even better? It's a, it's a matter of psychological leadership. And Moses definitely should have just put aside their doubts and say, you know what? We trusted Hashem in the past. He showed miracles. He showed things that were completely impossible in our understanding. But for some reason, he took the easier road. That's my right. okay. I think Amen. he shouldn't have. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think. Thank you, everyone, for your input. I think there is a there's a few points that are pretty much almost common denominators in many of the comments is that maybe Moshe didn't do something, did something wrong. Maybe he shouldn't have listened on the one hand or on the other hand, it could be theoretically wasn't right, but he didn't really have another choice. But the point being that it definitely is not what should have happened. So it's interesting to note there is a one of the biblical commentaries uh, Barbanel, we quoted him in the past. He actually says something very interesting. He says, "Why, why didn't Moshe, Why wasn't Moshe allowed to go into the land of Israel? Anyone remember? Because he hit the rock. Because he hit the rock, right? That's what the Torah says. So the Barbanel argues and says, "That's true, because he hit the rock, but that's not the real reason. That's the master reason. That's the." That's the, that's the open reason. The real reason is because he sent the spies. That's the real reason. He shouldn't have sent the spies. True, he wasn't on the same level as the rest of the nation that deliberately di disregarded what Hashem said and said that they don't want to go to Israel. But sending the spies on the part of Moshe was also not the proper thing to do. Maybe he wasn't intentionally going against Hashem, but unintentionally is going against Hashem. And that's really where Hashem, where Hashem, when Hashem decided He's not entering the land of Israel. However, since in the end of the day, Moshe wasn't, didn't really sin on the same level as the rest of the nation, Hashem didn't want to punish him together with the rest of the nation. So Hashem found a random thing that Moshe did, which wasn't right, hitting the rock, and Hashem said to speak to the rock. And said, aha, you're not going into the land of Israel. And I'm going to write in Torah, you're not going to the land of Israel because you hit the rock. But that's really not the real reason. The real underlying reason is that he sent the spies. That's the Barbanel's argument, which is definitely a novel idea, a novel idea, a unique idea. Um, it might answer a very big question. Hitting the rock is not such a terrible thing. You know, Hashem said, speak to it. He accidentally hit it. Earlier, Hashem said actually to hit it. So he got confused. What's, what's so wrong? What did he do wrong so much that, that he shouldn't be allowed to go into the land of Israel? So Byron says, I know what he did wrong. Hitting the rock, that's just a cover-up. What he did wrong was sending the spies. Well, this is the, this is the opinion of the Barbanel, but certainly the majority of biblical commentaries don't take that and understand that the reason why I wasn't allowed into Israel was for hitting the rock and not for sending in the spies. And as far as we're concerned about learning this from Torah portion, we don't see any indication that sending in the spies was something wrong on the part of Moshe. The nation did something wrong, especially the way they reacted to the, to the, 
to the story that the spies came back with. But we don't see in the Torah clearly on, on the surface any indication that Moshe did something wrong. And on the contrary, the Torah says three times in different places how Moshe didn't go into the land of Israel because of the story of the rock, because of hitting the rock instead of speaking to the rock. We don't see that the Torah ever says anything about uh, Moshe doing something wrong about the spies regarding in, in, this, in our episode, which leads us to think to the conclusion, leads us to the conclusion that perhaps Moshe didn't do anything wrong. And maybe the reason why Moshe listened to the, to the request of the Jewish nation, and he didn't even stop them when Hashem said, you decide, is for a very different reason. And the reason we're going to say is actually a very deep reason, a reason that is really one of a very fundamental idea in the teachings of the Rebbe. Rebbe one time spoke about this question, and he one time and he one time expressed one of his fundamental ideas as an answer to this question. But before, I'd like to say a small story. There was a Jew. His name was Svi Hirsch Weinrad. He lived, he had a organization. He was like a rabbi. He was also a professor. He wore many hats, he lived in Maryland, Maryland. He had many jobs. He was a rabbi, he was a professor. And at some point he felt that he's doing too much. He's involved in too many things. And he was thinking maybe to give up on one of the professions and one of the areas that he's involved in and to totally occupy and to use his, his energy for uh, focused in one area. And this was a question that really disturbed him. It was a very big question. It was a question that, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's really, it's like a life decision. And he really didn't know what to do. So he called the Rebbe's uh, secretary to office and he did introduce himself, but he told the, the general idea of his question and his, his, his problem for that reason, he didn't introduce himself, but he started to ask the question. Now, you, typically the Rebbe didn't get, a, the, the, the Rebbe had an open line to the secretary's phone. So the phone of the secretary was connected with the receiver in his office. And usually the rabbi didn't really speak on the phone. Only very occasionally would the rabbi like, uh, sometimes the rabbi would listen, like if someone was giving a report to the secretary and the rabbi want to hear it firsthand, he would listen in, but usually he won't comment, just listen. Very rarely would he actually um, interject and uh, and and, and uh, say a comment in during the phone call. But during this phone call, the rabbi says, there's someone you could ask in Maryland. There's a rabbi Weinweb over there. So he says, what? Th that's me. And the rabbi repeated himself. And again, he said, I'm going to be running with him. What do you mean I should speak to him? I'm the one that has the question. And the Rebbe responded that sometimes a person has to speak to himself. Right? That was the, that was the conversation. Now, the, that was the conversation. The message behind this conversation, the, the interpretation of what the rabbi was telling him probably could be understood in a number of ways. But perhaps one idea the rabbi was telling him that sometimes decisions have to be made by yourself. You have to make the decision. You have to talk to yourself and decide by yourself that this is what you want to do. This is how you're going to do it. And you shouldn't just always seek advice or instructions from someone else.
usually when we think about the world in general, you view it as a place where the ultimate is if a great miracle will be performed. Something out of the world would, would, would happen and we'll see the hand of Hashem, we'll see a great miracle, we'll see something that will shake the rules of nature and we would recognize his greatness. That's usually how we think. That'll be the ultimate. That'll be the purpose. That'll be the, the highest point. However, the truth is really the opposite. The point is not that the world should be lost or the rules of nature should be broken, but on the contrary, what Hashem wants is that we should bring godliness into this world. And we should make the world the way it is, a dwelling place and a place where his presence could be felt and he could be, so to speak, comfortable. The Medrash, a famous Medrash says that Hashem designed, when he created the world, Hashem desired that he should have a dwelling place in this world. And therefore he put Adam, Adam, Adam and Chav, Adam and Eve in the, in the garden, Gan Eden, and he wanted them to work the garden, meaning to make the garden a place that um, to do what Hashem wants in the garden. At the end of the day, they didn't fulfill their mission properly. They ate from the, from the tree of knowledge. And that was the first sin. And that caused a chain of many more sins. And Hashem was waiting. When would, when would I have a place to dwell in this, in this world? Until the tabernacle. That's where Hashem's presence was felt. And eventually that ended. And really, once the world was created... The purpose of the world was in, was, in, was in us, was in the people that were created on it. And that they should make the place a place where Hashem's presence could be felt. The world was not created for Hashem. Sometimes we feel, we think that the world was created for Hashem to show his greatness, to express his greatness, to perform miracles. But really, the, on the contrary, the world was created for people. The center of the, of, of the creation of the world is the person is us. And we should through, we should make our lives a place where Hashem is comfortable, our homes a place where Hashem is comfortable, and then eventually, in a way of a ripple effect, the whole world a place where Hashem's presence should be filled. That's the center. The center is the person that we should we should do it. With this in mind, we can understand what Moshe, why Moshe let the Jew, let, let, let the Jews make their decision about the spies. Moshe knew this secret, right? He knew the purpose is that we should go ahead and make decisions on how to act and how to fulfill Hashem's will. Up until this point, from when the Jews were taken out of Egypt, from before they're taken out of Egypt, to the year or so that they were that they were by Mount Mount Sinai, they were given instructions. They didn't have to make any decisions themselves. Shem took them out before the Hashem gave them instructions. Shem told them how to prepare. Hashem told them to, to all the commandments by Mount Sinai, by by the giving of the Torah. They were given instructions. They're told exactly what to do. But most should realize this is not going to last forever. These miracles that they're experiencing, these, these instructions that they're getting every other day is not going to last forever. And not only is it not going to last forever, it shouldn't last forever. That's not the way it's, just, it's, going, it's supposed to be. Yes, in the beginning, Hashem had to say, this is, the loop, this is the blueprint that you should follow. But it's not going to be in the coming years and generations that they're just going to get instructions every other day. They're going to have to make their own decisions. And this, not only this is not, this is not a, 
you know, a lower level of efficiency that they're not getting instructions, clear instructions. On the contrary, that is the purpose. The purpose is that we're not always getting clear instructions. We know in general what we're supposed to do. We are told thousands of years ago what to do. We're giving the Torah. And now it's our job to figure out how to do it. How to bring that into practice. And that's actually why we see a very interesting thing. The creation of the world is described in the Torah in how many verses? 26 or so. The building of the tabernacle, which is Hashem's home in this world, is discussed in how many verses? Hundreds. There's five Torah portions that speak about it. Why? Why is there a difference? Because the purpose of creation wasn't that Hashem showed a big trick and he, that he's able to create a world. The point wasn't, wasn't for Hashem to show his, his greatness. On the contrary, the point is to create human beings, to create people, and we should make the world a place, we should make the world a place, a dwelling place for him, a place where he'll be comfortable if through us doing what we're supposed to do. That's why the description of creating the, of building the tabernacle is so it's so, it's so many verses. It's the longest story in the Torah. The longest subject, the subject that is described in the, most, in the biggest, in the greatest detail. Why? Because that is the purpose. That is the goal. And who should, how should this goal be fulfilled? Not through step-by-step -step instructions. This goal is, for, is fulfilled through us making decisions. Yes. We are told what should be done, but we're not told how it should be done. And how it should be done is something that we have to decide. And that's why One, and one of the times that the Rebbe was speaking about this, 1989, he said that when he, he expressed, he was speak, when he discussed this topic, he said that when Moshe heard those words from Hashem, send it for yourself, send it based on your own understanding, Moshe was excited. He was happy about that. Because he realized we're, cheap, we're reaching a very high level. We're reaching a level that we are supposed to make decisions. Which is really the ultimate level, which is the level that we're supposed to get to. So not only he didn't see something negative, on the contrary, he saw something positive and he was excited about it. He was happy about it. Finally, we're able to make decisions. Finally, Hashem is saying, up until now, I dictated to you, to you exactly what to do. Now, I'm telling you to go. Go to Israel. How you should go, you get to decide. Not that you get to decide, you should decide. It's almost like raising children. A child, when they're young, the parents does everything for them. When they're very, very young, the parents does literally everything for them, besides breathing. Feeds them, gets them dressed, washes them, everything. Get a little older to become more independent, but still parents are involved. And then, yeah, eventually until the kids are totally independent. So which situation is better when the kid is totally in the, what, what's the purpose? What the, what, when, when does the parent feel that, um, um, it's always happy about children, but I mean, um, what is really the purpose more or less, you know, using purpose as a, the broader term, when the kid is old and developed and independent, He's independent, he's not relying on me. But on the contrary, that's why I'm so happy that he finally is able to do it himself. So that's exactly what's happening this week's Torah portion. That's exactly what, what, what the story of the spies is, the, this part of the story of the spies is all about. Most have realized up until this point, Hashem is like taking care of us. It's like tra training a kid on the... Um, to learn how to ride a bike, right? So in the beginning, you hold you hold the bike to make sure the bike doesn't fall. 
until finally the kid is able to ride a bike by himself. So the purpose is that the kid can ride on himself, do it by himself, without being held. In the beginning, you have to hold. So that's so too in our case. In the beginning, Hashem dictated exactly what to do. Here, the Jews came. We want to scout out the land. We want to see how to do it. Hashem didn't say terrible idea. On the contrary, you want to do it? Go ahead. Hashem says, you make the decision. And Moshe was happy. Yes, I want to, we want to make this decision. Now, the problem is, is that they came back with the, bad, with the wrong report. They didn't come back with the right. They, they came back with a, with a negative narrative and the discouraging narrative, which was, which was wrong. But the initial idea, not only it wasn't wrong, it's exactly what should have happened. And it's really what's happening until this day. Today, yesterday, no one heard a direct instruction what to do. Anyone heard a direct instruction to study Torah now? We didn't hear. The, the, the clear instruction to study Torah was given many, many years ago. But we know that's what we're supposed to do. And we make that decision to do it. And that's why, essentially, when the Jews entering the land of Israel, where that's really where they're, they were leaving that miraculous cloud. And they're really, now they're entering the land where they're going to have to work the land and going to have to live regular mundane lives. So, and really what was happening then is that's when they're supposed to bring into practice all the things they learned by Mount Sinai and leaving, leaving Egypt. And that bringing into practice has to be done from the person himself. In a very famous line, Rabbi, the, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe coined, um, phrased this idea the following. He writes the following, number five. He coined it in the following uh, phrase. There must be avoda. Avoda means service of Hashem. There must be service to Hashem by one's own effort. Superior heights are attained when one is taken by the hand and led. Right? If Hashem comes and leads us, it is more precious, though, when it's by one's own strength. What's more precious? Maybe we can reach higher levels standing by Mount Sinai and being in the desert. But what's more precious, what's the purpose? The purpose is that it should be done by a person's own strength. The purpose is that Hashem says, you send based on your own decision. The, where the spies, where the scouts went wrong is when... They confused the meaning of you do it by your own decision. When Hashem says you do it by your own understanding, Hashem is not saying you get to, you should decide if you want to do it or not. But rather, you should decide how you want to do it. What has to be done? Hashem sets clear. He sets the end goal. How it should be done, that's your decision. And not only it's, it could be your decision, it should be your decision. You have to ask, it should be your own initiative. And that's why not only it wasn't wrong for Moshe to listen to the Jews to send the spies, and not only he didn't see that, not only didn't see those red flags, he didn't see something wrong. On the contrary, it itself was not a bad thing. Again, the problem was, is when they started to question the whole mission when they started to say not only how they did not only they 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 want to decide how to do it they want to decide if they should do it and that's when they went wrong but up until that point it was a it was a hundred percent what was supposed to be done and i don't know and 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 essentially it's something that we're doing to this day making your own decisions Just to uh, summarize what we spoke today, that we started off with a question that the Jews were, that the Jews request from Moshe to, to uh, send out the scouts to scout out the land. And the question is, the obvious question is, why didn't Moshe stop them right away? Especially that we see it was up to Moshe's decision. Why didn't he stop them? And while some take it, that it was actually not, Moshe should have stopped them. And for whatever reason he didn't, the government really comes with a whole different approach. 
And he says, no. The reason why he didn't stop them is because he shouldn't have stopped them. And the reason why he didn't stop them is because they were doing something, they're, what they were doing was exactly the right thing to do. And Moshe was happy with it. Hashem was happy with it. What, what, what was right about it? What was right about it is that they came with their own decision. They wanted to figure out how to, how to fulfill what Hashem wants. Let's get out the land. Let's check out the land. And that itself is a good thing. That we should make our own decisions how to fulfill what Hashem wants. And which is essentially a very core value in Judaism. That when that the center is that we should make the right decisions in our life. And we should bring godliness into our life. We should bring it into our life. Not that it should be brought in from outside. Meaning not that it should be imposed on us. That's even a miracle, somewhat opposed, right? But rather we should willingly and by our own decision, own free choice, decide to do what's right. And that was really a demonstration of the, of the Jews making their own free choice and their own decision how to conquer the land. The only problem is what happened afterwards, step two, that they, they, they didn't want to do what they were supposed to do. That not only, right, like we said before, not only they, they didn't, they, not only they wanted to decide the how, they wanted to decide the if, if they should do it. And that's not okay. But the how, the purpose is that we should decide. And therefore, it's actually a very positive thing. The initial request and the initial idea of sending out scouts. Um, any questions or comments? All right, so um, everyone has a good afternoon. And, Thank uh, you, Rabbi. See you next week. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Thank you so Thank you much. Soon, it's interesting. We will definitely think about it. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very unique twist on the right. very unique take right. on it. Right, but sometimes it's difficult to separate the purpose of the methods of doing it, unfortunately. Right, the <laughs> right. so how and if to do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm understanding now that Moses actually did not have full emunah in Hashem when he sends out the, the Meragli. Why? He knew that God told him it's his decision, but but it means that, that he agrees with the people that there is a need for the Maraglim and he sends them out when, when Hashem actually keeps telling them that it's a great land and, and everything is great and they didn't really need to send the Maraglim. He says, I, I'm not going to do it. If you want to, you do it. No, but the question is, what should be his decision after the result came? That's, in my opinion, that's the biggest question. They came with the negative result. Not all of them. Some were saying, no, it's, it's possible. It's, it's a beautiful land. He saw the fruits of the land. He knew that in the past, so many things were miracles that were done with God's help. But Why the, people are saying, right? the people are saying they are not going in. They're going back to Egypt. Yeah, but they many times they did it. They did it when it was a golden calf. And they did it when they complained about food. He tried to change their opinion. He really tried to show the leadership. Why in this particular situation, he simply agreed to, to, you know, to come along. That's something that... I think that that's the biggest punishment that he actually deserved, that he had this mentality of someone who is a slave, who is not taking risks, who is not seeing that the purpose is more important sometimes than the mean of doing it, that the way to do it. That's, that's in my opinion, a question. His reaction, what, what happened after? Why didn't he try to convince? He had support of two people who came. And I, you, I agree, it's not, it's funny to call them spies. They were just delegation 
of people who came to, you know, to see what's going but, on. But the Torah tells you that the people were going to stone all four of them. Him, Aaron, yeah. and the two that agree with it. And I think what's an, an important um, idea is, was sending out spies inherently wrong? Was sending out those people an inherently wrong thing to do? So some may argue that the fact that they sent out the scouts, that shows that they're not trusting Hashem. Right. And that is inherently wrong. Yes. However, however, one may argue a little different. For example, let's say, choose a mitzvah. Let's say I want to eat matzah on Pesach, Passover, right? So I can't just wake up on Passover like, oh, I want matzah. A week, a few weeks before, I have to go to the store and buy it. If there's none in the store, I have to cut the weed and make and, and bake the and break bake the matzah until I have it available on Passover. Let's say I want to put on tefillin. Tefillin is a process; it doesn't just it doesn't grow on a tree. You have to make it. So perhaps it's the same idea here. Hashem said, "Go into the land of Israel," but they could just go in and and. Um, go in um, blindly, which would basically be relying on a miracle to happen. Well, it's not blindly. God is their eyes. No, no. For sure, Hashem is telling them to do it. But who said Hashem is saying that you should rely on an open miracle? Is scouting out challenging your trust in Hashem? Not necessarily. I can say that I know that we're going to win. I know that Hashem wants us to go. I'm not questioning that. But I want to do it in a way just like every commandment I prepare before I do it, right? You're not questioning if it should happen, but you're preparing for it. So there might be an argument on the other way, on the other side, that it's not, it wasn't something inherently wrong. What was wrong is when they, when they made the decision, we're not going in because of it. But until that point, that's not wrong. On the contrary, Hashem said, yeah. conquer the land. Where should we go? We get to decide. Say, we'll send out scouts to decide where to go. Right, so I think that's one of the points that maybe there are there could be two views on, and it seems like here the rabbi is saying that it's not inherently wrong the fact to send out scouts. What's inherently wrong is for you to make a decision that we're not going because we don't like we don't like the the report. But to send out that's like preparing to 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 that's like preparing matzah before Passover, or preparing a book to study Torah from before you want to study, or any other preparation that you'll do before a mitzvah before fulfilling a commandment of Hashem. All right? All right. Um, yeah. All right, have, so everyone have a good afternoon. And uh, we'll see you uh, next week, God willing. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. For your extra time. To <laughs> sure. Appreciate it. Okay.